so we can just jump right into it. Okay. So uh, to leave it wide open, where do you want to start? I know there's a thousand places. There's a, yeah, but... there's a thousand places. Um, maybe we could start with a little bit about who I am and why I would do such a thing now. And I could be in the garden yeah. pro preserving my food. Yeah. Well, you look like you're relatively sane, so, <laughs> so something poked you in a new direction. Yeah, definitely something poked me in a new direction. I mean, I did run uh, before in 2011 in Fredericton mm -hmm. when I first arrived here. Um, and I ran because Elizabeth May is a dear friend and colleague and asked me to, to represent the party here. Um, but I was not ready at that time the way I am today. Um, I've done my PhD since then. I've moved to Keswick Ridge. I have more relationships. I feel more part of the community. Um, so when David asked me, I thought, you know, I could think about retiring and just the garden, or I could try and see what we could do in this election. Hmm. And that's what I decided to do. Hmm. It's always interesting talking to rookie candidates, sort of, or because you've got to try to get people to see what it is that you're bringing yeah. that then goes into the mix in the legislature. Yeah. Um, almost everyone says, you know, like, I have a good heart, I'll do good things, and, and that stuff. But it is a job interview. In it a way. is a job interview. And, and I'm wandering down a, a different road. But, yeah. So you need skill sets to match a job interview. Exactly. Because afterward, when someone becomes the Minister of Health or Minister exactly. of Education, exactly. we're in public saying things exactly. like, well, how could that person have the skills for that exactly. job? Exactly. So does yours align somewhere that you yeah. think this is my skill set, this is where it's going to run? Totally. So there's two things I'd say. First, I think I'm actually the most qualified candidate of the candidates in the riding. And I can say that with confidence because I've worked for 30 years um, on policy, legislation, programs, manage big budgets, I've managed lots of people, um, I've worked on climate change, I've worked in international climate negotiations, I've worked with the federal, provincial and municipal governments, I have two Queen's medals for my citizenship, uh, so I have probably more experience than most MLAs ever have uh, entering the house, unless maybe they've been a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, and you squeezed all that into a minute, like there's a lifetime you just offered. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> And well, can you give us a for instance? Like, yeah, um, absolutely. An anecdote of, of, of uh, maybe a highlight, a career highlight. Yeah, of some absolutely. Sort. Um, I was one of the first two people hired in Canada to work on climate change in 1990 at Friends of the Earth Canada um, and spent the first 17 years of my work in Ottawa was fundamentally a part of the negotiations for our climate change uh, treaty under the uh, at the Earth Summit in 1992 mm -hmm. um, and then continued in the negotiations right through to the Kyoto Protocol and beyond. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a highlight for sure. When we finished that, I really thought naively that we were on the way as a country. We had a legally binding target and here we go, right? Now it's time to implement. So I left the NGO sector and went to work for the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. What an experience. I was, in, I was responsible for not just environmental policy for municipal governments across the country in terms of federal negotiations. I was also responsible for all sustainability program. I helped secure um, about $250 million from the federal government to start the Green Municipal Fund, set up something called Partners for Climate Protection, where municipalities have a milestone program for reducing emissions and adapting. Hmm. Um, and we had a sustainable communities conference every couple of years, awards program. Um, so if both for the Kyoto negotiations and my work at FCM, I was awarded the, uh, the Queen medals. Yeah. So in that dynamic now, you're going to put on the political hat. Yeah. I'm making a hunch here. Somewhere in that experience that you just mapped out, and one experience of many, um, something didn't happen. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> you know, so is that what puts you into the political sphere Yes, now? yes. I'm so frustrated. Um, uh, let's just focus on the work I'm currently doing in New Brunswick. Uh, part of my climate change work includes a lot of research and analysis. I do research on the communication side, how to better engage people. Mm -hmm. um, but I do a lot of policy work. One of the priority uh, changes that were required to solve climate change is changes to electricity. Um, and one of the biggest things holding us back in New Brunswick is uh, a committed government to actually commit to 
solid electricity reform um, and ensuring that we move out of the oil, coal and gas plants um, and invest more in efficiency and uh, renewable energy. So I'm in it for uh, not just our riding, which has really important issues that I'm very keen on supporting and fighting for, yeah. but also for the policy work to try to help New Brunswick move ahead in a much more positive um, and innovative way, an exciting embrace of the future, which we're not doing at the moment. So I want to see your face when I say small nuclear reactor. Oh, yes. Let's talk about that. It's one of my favorite topics right now. Um, so um, I, I'm a person who's very much evidence-based in the work that I do. I don't take an opinion on anything without solid research. For the last six months or so, we've been investigating what's all this about. Um, so let me give you on the one hand and on the other hand. On the one hand, um, I actually have an appreciation for the challenges that MB Power is facing. Um, it has a legislated mandate um, to deliver affordable, reliable, and sustainable electricity, but also to reduce its debt. So what it's trying to do is find ways to uh, invest in innovation, but to do so off book, as they call it. Yep. So uh, small modular nuclear has two kind of elements to it that are attractive to them. One is it's a source of federal money. Okay, <laughs> good. Uh, and two... Um, they really feel that the government currently feels that it's an opportunity for economic development because we have a nuclear plant here, we have Point La Pro, we have a site and that kind of thing. On the negative side, um, what this really is, is another one of the, uh, for me, a sad example of how New Brunswickers are easily um, hoodwinked. Uh, we've been hoodwinked, whether it was Maritime Iron or whether it's Joy Scientific. Um, and there is, at this point, based on the research we've done and the experts we are listening to, first, uh, several things to say. One is no actual experience on the ground to back up any of the claims that this source of electricity will be cheaper, that it will be easier to uh, construct. Um, or that it will uh, be uh, kind of the energy source of the future. To interrupt just a second on that point, um, and to deepen it for the audience yeah. maybe, is that because no one's done it before? Are we trying to be the first so that we can have sort of a technology that we can then sell? Yeah. So uh, there are um, plants in, um, uh, I think, China and Russia, two locations that aren't very uh, open in terms of providing information. Mm -hmm. You do see small nuclear on submarines, um, completely outside of the realm of what we're talking about. Okay. Um, so no, there are no plants operating. Um, this is speculative. Um, the technology idea is if it's hard to get nuclear built when they're too big, they're too expensive, um, then let's go small um, and let's go modular and see if we can reduce uh, construction costs. There are three areas I think are actually seriously uh, dangerous here. One is the idea is that you would have lots of small modular nuclear plants around the world. They would be smaller, supposedly, um, although the plant they're suggesting for Point La Pro is 300 megawatts. That's not actually small. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but there'd be more numerous. And the claim is that they would use existing nuclear waste um, and um, that's a good thing. What that means is you've ta you're taking nuclear waste that's now concentrated in, in one or two locations and spreading it everywhere mm -hmm. in these plants. Transportation, higher risks. I've seen some analysis that says you know even if they could get the cost down which is not shown or that they would be more easy easily constructed which is not shown um, that you're actually increasing nuclear proliferation risks because you're concentrating this nuclear uh, nuclear fuel waste. Um, so for all those reasons, uh, my assessment at this point, I'm happy to be re-educated, but I've not seen any evidence to change my mind at this point. Hmm. Um, my conclusion is that small modular nuclear will not deliver electricity to New Brunswick or elsewhere certainly not in the next 10 to 15 years, which is when we actually need to reduce global emissions of greenhouse gases to essentially half and then very quickly to zero. Um, the result, I believe, will be that the commitment to small modular nuclear will lead to New Brunswick 
claiming future emission reductions on a speculative technology and asking the federal government to let them run the coal, oil and gas plants longer. So it's a recipe for increased greenhouse gas emissions. I don't finally just say that I don't think small modular nuclear will be able to compete with the lower cost sources of electricity from on and offshore wind and the rapidly declining uh, battery uh, technologies. And so, uh, you know, those technologies combined with uh, connections to uh, Hydro-Quebec and to Newfoundland Labrador would allow us to have the stability in a system that has more distributed and what they call intermittent sources. We can do this, but we have to think more regionally. Hmm. We have to integrate our electricity system um, and we have to help NB Power deal with its, its reality, which is its debt and these other requirements. Hmm. You've answered in part a question that's hovered for me for a couple of years. Uh, when I match the, the responsibilities for MB Power with the size of the province, uh, population-wise, yeah. Yeah. So we have a fair amount of infrastructure for a fairly small population. That's right. I know some of that's because of regional distribution, because uh, yeah. we're, we're dispersed, even though it's a small geographic yeah. area compared to Ontario, Quebec, Manitoba. Yeah. So I've always wondered... Um, why I never hear the question, do we already have enough power? It's the type of power. Exactly. So when you offered up the regional model, um, that could take an awful lot of pressure, I would imagine, off of a suburb, 780,000 exactly. people, yep. to, to have their consistent supply of power. Because when I pose this question with some of my MB Power friends, they're really quick to push back about, you know, solar can't do it, wind can't do yeah. it, and this, and because they have a mindset for how this works and an obligation for how this works. Exactly. And so, and that's fine because that all is. Yeah. So how do we get past it so that 20 years from now in 2040, exactly, we're we're in another exactly. scheme, and you've offered some of the solutions for that. Yeah, absolutely. We should change course from okay. MB Power to, um, let's go back to being a, a candidate again, mm -hmm. and. Uh, so it's not just the environmental stuff. I'm trying to get exactly. you away from the box that you're always exactly. putting. You're exactly. Green Party candidate. Exactly. Oh, they're environmental. I was like, no, exactly. there's a full meal here. Because exactly. you, you go through one door, you're going to connect to yeah, all the other exactly. doors. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so go Great. somewhere there Thank with you. all Thank the you. other things. Thank you. Um, so the first thing I, I said when I announced um, was that green values are conservative values. Right. So when you think about, um, you know, how our platform comes together and what, how we think, right, everything's connected. Hmm. Right. So our social or ecological or environmental, it's connected. You can't take one piece and, and not think about how they affect each other. Um, we believe in self-determination, self-sufficiency, self-reliance. We believe in not wasting money. We believe in not subsidizing unsustainable activities. Um, we believe in innovation and we believe in small business, local economic development. I'd say the one big thing that people, um, I hope, can remember about what it is to be green um, and it's something that I, I share with my students, right? That we are diminished in what we perceive democracy is. Um, we have moved from more of a democratic process, what I would call participatory democracy, to representative democracy, where mm -hmm. we think that being a citizen is to vote every four years, which is what Mr. Higgs has asked for. Mm -hmm. Give me a mandate, leave me alone. I don't want to deal with the house, right? I just want to <laughs> implement my plan. Yep. Greens do not believe in that. What Greens believe in is participatory democracy, local decision making, local direction, local involvement. Um, and so that democratic process of participation is fundamentally a core principle. It's why we're so committed to proportional representation. So if you were to pick three things about what it is to be green, it's that yes, environmental in the context of social and economic, it's about democracy, participatory democracy, um, and that means reform, right? And so we're about refocusing things, um, cutting waste, but also getting electoral reform. Hmm. This is still big picture stuff, and we will get to writing specific yeah. stuff. But So when you say that, um, what pops to mind for me pretty quick is the Finn Report and yeah. municipal reform. Yep. Yeah. Uh, 350 plus local governing structures yep. for a population yep. of 760,000 people, and it's stuck. Yeah, 
it, it something happens yeah. at the grassroots level or the communication yeah. level that Sussex Corner says, no way I'm amalgamating yeah. with Sussex. That's right. Or New Maryland says, no way I'm going to work with Fredericton. Or yeah. St. John in Rossay, Chris Pam says, like, no matter where you go, yeah. there's something that's stuck, even though we know that that is the solution because yeah. the Finn report was amazing. Yeah. So, so uh, how do we yeah. get Good. There. I love this question because I'm very familiar with this story. We tried to get a rural community um, in our uh, area in Keswick Ridge and a surrounding area um, right through to Kings Clear. Um, so it would have been a large rural community um, and we failed. We failed in the referendum. So here's my take on that. We need municipal reform. That municipal reform has to happen alongside property tax reform. Okay. The key issue that um, stood in our way was that there was the claim by government that creating the rural community would mean a modest increase in property tax. I know from my social psychology research that when you talk about money, it triggers your selfish uh, values. You move from collective values to me, me, me. I actually think that the way to get electoral or municipal reform through um, is for the government to say, we're going to do this, but there'll be no property tax increase. Um, because once you are a rural community, you have access to other sources of revenue. You can apply for infrastructure yes. money. You can get yes. the gas tax money. So it killed us, just that fight about property taxes. The second thing I would say, um, and it's a very interesting uh, and real uh, not just interesting. I, I want to even take that back. It's not mm. interesting. It's it's ridiculous. There have been deals done with industry that have lowered the property taxes that they pay to the detriment of our municipal governments. People think it's a St. John issue. It's a, it's a Nakowick issue. It's an Edmonston issue. Nakowick lost $450,000 of its municipal budget had to lay off staff and raise its property taxes four mm. percent because of the deal finance minister higgs made with the mill mm -hmm. um that's got to change so we see it as a two-part municipal reform with property tax reform so that industry pays its fair share and we get this process through in a way that um, allows people to stay focused on the community benefits not worried about their selfish concerns around money not that mm. that's a negative thing it's just that that's what happens and you can't see yep. much else after that yeah because it's an emotional yeah. response that's right and at that point you're in a different space we can't even have a conversation yeah yeah and when you talk about the the tax breaks that hearkened for me um Everyone kind of likes Google, says Google's a good yeah. company, but yeah. a little bit of digging and research, find where they put their server farms. They put all kinds of pressure on small communities where they plant the server farms yeah. near a coal-fired electricity exactly. plant because it's cheaper electricity exactly. to not pay their taxes. So the downward spiral is driven by a corporate mindset. Exactly. And when it moves into a small province like New Brunswick, it's really hard to push back. Exactly. Because you can hear the other side is, but it created jobs or it sustained jobs or... Yeah. So there's value shift rather than a, a project shift that totally. needs to emerge. Exactly. Um, earlier, the way you were describing stuff, I'm thinking, yeah, it's a systemic approach to a systemic problem as opposed to a project approach exactly. to a systemic problem. Exactly. That's why we don't progress. Exactly. Um, uh, play with the, and again, it's a provincial thing, but it, it's good because if you get in the legislature, you got to mm -hmm. do exactly. these dances. You exactly. Know? Um, uh, the closing of the hospitals. Yes, um, obviously, uh, that was poorly handled. And obviously, we need to keep, you know, uh, rural emergency rooms um, open. The thing that, um, again, Greens take a holistic approach. Hmm. We really believe in community-based, team-based health care. Hmm. Um, and so we're looking at serious reform of the health care system to allow for rural communities um, to have a doctor um, and a nurse um, whether it's your mental health, your physical health, all being there available to you on a team uh, basis. We think this will save us a lot of money. We have good experience, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, my doctor is in Sussex. <laughs> mm -hmm. I should not have to go to Sussex to see my doctor. And so um, we're looking mm -hmm. for serious reform there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> in interviews with Chris Austin, he'll bring up the clinic that's in Minto. Yeah. Then and you'll say it's a shining example. Yeah. And of course, media will will give you lots of negative light, and sometimes won't give you the light on the positive yeah. things. 
And there can be a chuckle around when the mental hospital was closed 20 some odd years ago. And protesters are literally bouncing on the top of cars in front of Centennial mm. Building. They were so upset they were losing their hospital. Mm. Um, and then over time, you find out that this community health clinic covers 90% of what they need to more efficiently. You yeah, can recruit exactly. doctors. You can re exactly. recruit the nurse practitioners. You know, exactly. That this team approach works. And somehow that story still hasn't trickled through the rest yeah. of the province. Yeah. Four years ago, I interviewed John McGarry um, when he was CEO of Horizon Health. Mm -hmm. And he explained in detail with passion... Uh, about you know, regional health care delivery in New Brunswick. And at some point, we can't keep carrying the cost of the small exactly. rural hospitals. Exactly. It gets in the way of uh, recruitment and retention yeah. of medical professionals because they want to work in bigger yeah. facilities, newer equipment. Yeah. And, and yet, that community, there's a certain breed of professional that wants to work in a small community-based thing. And that stays stuck yeah. for getting the message across because yeah. the St. Stephen Hospital protest happened two weeks after that interview four years yeah. ago. And, and it, it just got all jumbled yeah, up. Yeah. Somewhere in there, as a politician, do you th is that the place where the message will break through at last? Or is it going to get caught in, um, it's my agenda and I'm pushing it through? So the collaborative decision-making yeah. thing applied not just at the community level, but sneak it all the way into the legislature? Well, that would be great too, wouldn't it? Um, I mean, one of the things uh, that, uh, you know, I'm... I see every every day in terms of the work I do and I see David speaking to is that you know it's rare that we have legislative committees where we have public hearings where we have the opportunity to come and make an intervention mm. um, and so there is a lot that happens outside of the legislature that we think could be improved if there was more consultation and collaboration mm. um, again you know coming back to the hospital situation I see it similarly as I do the municipal reform with property tax reform you solve that together right with the health care it's it's you know you if you're in a conversation about taking away you're not going to get very far we have to be in a conversation about what we're going to bring um and then whatever adjustments can be engaged through that process of consultation hmm. the community can agree we'll let that go because we can see that we're going to have this and so i think that would be you know part of the process that we'd want to follow in terms of how we'd move forward there as we were chatting, uh, getting ready to do this, yeah. um, you were describing how um, your constituency or your riding is equal to the size of PEI. <laughs> it's big. Which, that's the first time I've heard that one. Yeah. So that's kind of fun in a way for yeah. people to get their heads around yeah. like, oh, you got to go one end of the island <laughs> exactly. to the other. Exactly. And, and so when we think of rural New Brunswick, which is a unique and quite wonderful way to live. Yeah. And it's, you can almost see a revival in it, whereas the rest of the country gets more and more focused on their big cities. Yeah. There's a whole other set of people that don't exactly. want to live that way. Yeah. So we have to sustain and nurture that and not protect it, but integrate it so that it stays there for 100 years. Yeah. That gets to food. Yep. Um, that gets to high speed internet. Exactly. Um, so you want to, because those things have to be they buried to be in there. your riding somewhere. Exactly. They're, it's top priorities, actually. Um, I work from home. Um, so I know how important high-speed uh, internet is. Um, and uh, the platform which came out today is pretty strong on this. Um, it basically says that, that companies will be required to provide a, a plan for how they will deliver um, high-speed internet throughout New Brunswick, or a green government will create a crown corporation to do it. So okay. it's a priority. It's, it would happen. Mm. Um, food security. I mean, I live in an agricultural uh, riding. Um, there's a mix of large, small, and um, medium-sized, you know, farmers, yeah. homesteaders, um, and so on. People are very much um, appreciative of uh, their capacity to grow food. We have a lot of self-sufficiency skills there, um, and it's a good thing because in a rural environment, when you have like something like Hurricane Arthur, nobody comes because yeah. <laughs> yep. the population's too too remote, and so we're too dispersed, and so you know you're on your own. Um, so food security is a priority and supporting young farmers getting into it. People who want, I teach at the university, my partner teaches at the university. We have students who just all they want to do is be where we are, grow food like we do, and we need to help them get access to that first piece of land. So things like land trusts, you know, municipalities have access to land. What can they make available? All sorts of things like that around food. Um, there are also, though, um, you know, other uh, issues of concern. Um, uh, we've got uh, seniors that 
having to are having to leave our riding uh, to go to town because they don't have access to things. Um, so another priority is affordable uh, community-based housing for seniors uh, to try to keep them. You know, we've had some wonderful, wonderful people who have just been a huge asset to the community in Keswick Ridge have to move to town because they just couldn't take care of the property anymore. So um, we think seniors and affordable seniors housing is um, another uh, piece of this for sure. Do you ever think sometimes between the gaps of all those pieces there's there's job opportunities there or business opportunities there? There are. Um, absolutely there are business opportunities there. Um, you know just take the you know the climate crisis um, it is going to drive a complete reorientation of the economy um, globally. Um, mm -hmm. If you can't make money <laughs> off of the transition yep. to a clean, electrified economy, um, that will be what powers um, our society as mm. we move forward. Um, there's something wrong. One of coming back to um, one of the challenges we face in New Brunswick is this perception that. Um, Whereas I see NB Power, how can you not be a winner in an electrified economy where you've got static demand now, which means static revenue, you want to grow your base, electrified transportation, more electrified processes and industry. How can you not be excited about this? Part of the challenge, again, is what's on book right? What debt they might be mm -hmm. worried about, but also um, how we've been uh, securing our energy efficiency and renewable energy. Let me give you an example. If it's a nuclear plant, if it's a coal plant, if it's a gas plant, if it's an oil plant, if it's a hydro dam, it's a publicly owned asset by MB Power. But they contract out to the private sector for their energy efficiency and renewable energy. It was part of this, let's keep as much debt off the books as possible. Why can't we have not, yes, we want to support and encourage and grow the small companies in New Brunswick that w are installing solar, and want to deliver wind, want to deliver energy efficiency? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But why can't the utility also have publicly owned solar farms, wind, all sorts of these things which would keep those dollars in our economy? The uh, wind turbines that we have, there's about 300 megawatts. Uh, the argument to me was, well, they, that's just money that left the province. Well, it is because you hired Transalta. <laughs> <laughs> that's by design, not yeah. by default. Yeah. So um, we need to think about those jobs in, in New Brunswick, what we can bring here, what our value added is. Um, and we have skills that other locations don't have um, when it comes to food, when it comes to value added product products around forestry. We need to make that grow. We want that to grow. Mm -hmm. People who can live rurally and work from home because there's high speed internet can work from here, mm -hmm. anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so there are opportunities. We need to embrace them. The challenges, and this is you know part of my complaint about politics and certainly in my writing, um, it remains too trapped in old thinking. Um, we have what I consider to be in my career, and I've worked across the country and around the world, the worst case of the old boys network I've ever seen. Um, and so we need to break that apart and let new people come in, women and young people and so on, um, to generate new thinking. And I'm hoping this election will be a step in that direction. That theme speaks to New Brunswick for the first time in 100 years, electing a minority government. Yeah. Interesting. We're in the midpoint of this election, and the pollsters are doing what the pollsters do. Yeah. And no one's ever taken them to account that they were wrong last time, like yeah. wrong by a lot. Yeah. And here they are cranking it out again. News media is gobbling yeah. it up because it's cheap information yeah. and thinking... No, you've missed it. Two years ago, something shifted. Exactly. Um, and that gets into the backroom gang. I yeah. don't use the old boys thing anymore. Okay. Because <laughs> okay. ba it's mixed. Gang. It's okay. mixed now, okay. right? There's, okay, a, there's a lot of women in that yeah. mix now. Yeah. Um, but the influencers over the political parties, because it doesn't matter. The old narrative was, it doesn't matter who's in power. Yeah. The influencers are still going to say, we're doing this, we're doing yeah. this. And and there's a, a lot of them, not just the one that tends to wear that mantle the most. There's, yeah. there's a few. So shifting to the minority government put an awful lot of emphasis on the committee work, yeah. which David spoke with passion about, yeah. Chris spoke with passion about. Yeah, because um, yeah, now we're in it. No, here's your four things. That one doesn't go. That one doesn't go. Yeah. And it was process, pure process. Yeah. And uh, 
So it must have been really frustrating yes, for the ones exactly. that are used because, no, exactly. give me my agenda and let me run. Exactly. We, for New Brunswick to continue in this direction, because it was a s small but big step yeah. um, two years ago, then that would mean we're, we're starting to model a new form of large-scale decision-making and practice. But they didn't have much time. It took almost six months for the legislative staff to even figure out how to integrate exactly. a fourth party. Yeah. Um, so you want to, I'm, I'm hesitant because we're talking process rather than specifics yep. and yep. audiences like specifics, yep. Yep. this project, that project, that project. Yep. So can you play with how you would envision if it was a second minority government yep. or if, if it was uh, one has a majority, but the other three have enough to kind of yeah, topple exactly. it, right? So yep. it's still not quite the full old scale majority, yep. but if these three combine, they can still make that one stop. Yeah. Is that where the breakthrough will come, uh, whether it's municipal form is stuck or a different model for energy generation yeah. the province is stuck or a different health care strategy is stuck? Yeah. Is that truly the place where it's all stuck in that it's the backroom gang that are keeping it a certain way rather than the legislature and committees and a more integrated process? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'll say just a couple of things about it from my own experience, which is not yet a legislative experience um again having lived elsewhere in the country and worked with many orders of government you know we are more of a captured state here from a large industry one named company point of view hmm. um and um for me and the work i do uh to see just how much access irving has under mr higgs compared to anywhere else in this country is is kind of shocking hmm. um, the premier's never met with anybody that I ever work with but I know it can be a phone call away for some other people hmm. that kind of disproportionate access to power um, and influence um, is not healthy for any um, uh, democracy um, so that's just at the level of the captured state um, and so I think for me we need minority government, but we need Greens, I think, being in a very strong position. Um, if it's a similar minority as to last time, then as you saw, right, the, um, the Conservatives were able to essentially do what they wanted to do with um, the People's Alliance support. Um, I think that if we want to unlock some of the issues that we've talked about, that needs to shift for a strong either majority for the Greens or minority where the Greens hold the balance of power. Hmm. To slide this back to what you said earlier on municipal reform and, and taking something away and watching people uh, contract, yeah. right? Yeah. Somewhere in, in that whole conversation about who really is making the decisions, yeah. it, it ties to economy and jobs because that's what most people will do with that. Yeah. So when I had Peter Linfield on the show five years ago, and he was talking in 20 or 30 year terms how forestry and forestry models have changed. Yeah. And in New Brunswick, we're, we're kind of late, yeah. even though we don't know it, sort of. So the forestry model is going to change by 2030 or 2035. Yeah. So we better start finding something now for those 28,000 jobs yeah. that, to come. So that has that sense of taking something away. Yeah. So does the, do the Greens have what takes that place? Yeah. So is yeah. it a five-year transition, 10-year, yeah. 15, and yeah. those 28,000 jobs go from doing this to doing this to yeah. doing this? Yeah. So people don't have that sense of something being Absolutely. taken away, and, and now what are we going to do? We're Absolutely. destitute. Absolutely. So let me come at that from a climate change point of view because um, I think it's going to be the driver of the innovative revolution. Okay. Good. <laughs> I talked energy. What I haven't talked about is natural systems, right? So, um, you know, the carbon that's going into the air is coming from us burning fuels, but it's also coming from us um, interfering with plants and trees' ability to absorb carbon through photosynthesis. So urban development, clear clearing for agricultural purposes, and clear-cutting for forestry purposes is disrupting um, the Earth's ability to absorb carbon. So we're slowing down the carbon cycle. The solution, not just on, it's not just energy, it's a massive increase of conservation, protection, and restoration. New Brunswick has the kind of forest type 
in terms of the Acadian forest that is the most resilient according to the climate forest specialists to climate change. Whether um, we're looking at the drying aspects of it or the extreme heat aspects of it or the budworm aspects of it, um, we are vulnerable not because of a natural reality. We're vulnerable because of our forestry practices. The mm. overall, what we call borealization of the forest over hundreds of years of, of interference. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and what the scientists are saying is the best forest for New Brunswick is an Acadian forest in the face of climate change. It's also the best forest to capture carbon and mm. to hold carbon. So if we're looking at jobs, I see uh, kind of three lines of opportunity here. One is on restoration. So people working in the woods, bringing that forest back to ecological health. I see jobs in um, value-added uh, products, but also in the carbon aspect of it, sequestering carbon and biofuels. So we have an opportunity um, to use forest material at appropriate scale, not huge hmm. electricity plants, but think more boilers, more distributed schools, buildings, or whatever. Um, we can create ethanol. We can create other kinds of products from um, our plant-based um, materials. So there is an enormous opportunity in the bioeconomy, and we need to embrace that. Um, right now, we're grinding up the forest for toilet paper. Mm -hmm. You can do better. <laughs> Good, thanks. Um, let's go back in particular to your riding. So what are you hearing the most as you manage to get around or talk to people? What yeah. is it that's hot for where you live and where you want to represent? Internet um, is okay. certainly Back one big that. issue, absolutely. Um, seniors issues. Um, uh, interesting, just today, the conversation I had was with a, a large-scale farmer who's like, we need deer management, right? We are overrun in our Keswick Ridge area um, with, with deer um, and we need to be able to manage that. It's not easy. We can have 30, 50, 100 deer um, in our fields. Hmm. Um, so um, that's an issue. And of course, they're being kind of run out of the woods through um, loss of habitat. Yep. Um, uh, interestingly, most of the people who are talking to me, uh, young people and the women and the folks who are green, um, it is because they want to see changes to forestry. They want to see a, an end to glyphosate, uh, glyphosate uh, spraying. Mm -hmm. They want to see an end um, and uh, an end to basically fossil fuel consumption and um, the shift on climate change. And so um, the environment piece comes up all the time, but it comes up through you know, can we stop subsidizing the bad stuff and try to invest more effectively in the good stuff? Yeah. What's the most fun for you with this? I'm really surprised, actually, because <laughs> um, contrary to what might appear to be the case, I'm actually quite introverted. So, um, <laughs> Good line. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm out there, but it's exhausting. Yeah. So um, I never thought I would be having so much fun mm. so um we're really doing the social media thing i'm post i'm doing videos every day like not just yep. serious videos which i'm happy to do i can po talk policy till the cows come yeah. home yeah. but i'm doing like funny videos and trying to engage people um you know doing our little pop-ups you know going to these little things delivering signs and talking to people i'm actually really enjoying it and part of what i've enjoyed about the experience is i love constituency work Hmm. Um, I was actually the first student, first person who graduated from college to be a legislative intern in the Ontario legislature. Usually it's lawyers and, and such. Mm -hmm. um, and I worked for two interesting people, uh, Sheila Copps and Mike Harris, both of whom became <laughs> environment minister range. and the one. Well, you get to work two sides of the house. Yep. Half your internship with a member of government and yeah. half with a member of opposition. Wow. Pure chance I picked Mike Harris and Sheila Copps. Um, she became environment minister, and we uh, worked effectively federally in the in the Kyoto negotiations. I'm a very much will work with any government of any stripe. And Mike Harris, I did his constituency work. Hmm. I love constituency work. 
Um, I like to solve problems and I like to hear what's on people's minds and what their issues are. At FCM, Federation of Canadian Municipalities, that's what we did as well. Tell us what your issue is, we're going to figure out and I would bring the people together to solve that and that's what I love about it. Here's a bit of a curve and we'll see what happens um, because it's a pattern in New Brunswick politics mm -hmm. and it's never talked about in the media okay. and, mm -hmm. and you're the first person that fits some of the category. Uh, so when I've done my homework on the legislature the past two years, yeah. only one person is not born and raised, elected in that legislature. And, and you can see it, you can go back further if you want, but two years or two elections was enough for me. Last election, we had more candidates than ever before, okay. 246, 245, somewhere around there because of the five parties and yeah. some independents. And stuff. In that mix, I think it was 10 or 15, maybe 20% were not born and raised in New Brunswick. Okay. Almost all of them that get into the legislature are born and raised. When you go through the door-to-door -door work and, you, oh, I know so-and-so yep. went to high school with them. Yep. Oh, and, and that's a class. That could be Quebec or Ontario or, or Manitoba because, you know, it's, we're really rural in a lot of ways. Yep. <laughs> Our values about I know so-and-so. Exactly. But it, it definitely presents itself as an obstacle yep. for someone running for public office yep. in New Brunswick if you're not born and raised from here. Exactly. That thing gets into... What happens in the legislature and bringing the old behaviors and the old grievances and the old habits yeah because it's third generation through now exactly slightly different from always voting red or always voting blue yeah um it's like oh, i know i'll vote for so-and-so because i know mom and dad I'll absolutely vote for um you are the first person i've interviewed that is that person yeah so if you want to speak to it, great. Yeah. If you don't want to speak yeah, to no. it, we can just edit it out. Yeah, you know? yeah, no, let's talk about it. So what's it like? Like, do you identify um, when someone asks where you're from and you start telling your stories yeah. about Ontario? Well, and do, do they go, oh, you're not from here? Yeah. And they want to dismiss you because yeah. you can't possibly understand yeah. what it's like to yeah, be here, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or is it that, oh, we need, we need new people that are yeah. from away to bring their ideas and yeah. integrate? Um, I haven't encountered anything like that personally. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's no doubt that it's a very tribal, uh, thing. Hmm. Um, no, for sure. I'm new. Um, I've lived in Keswick Ridge since 2010. My father was from Negawak. I mean, the Camos arrived in 1634. We're here. Yeah. We arrived in New Brunswick, <laughs> 1758. We're here. Yep. Um, and so, you know, I feel my roots are definitely here, but I don't speak French because I grew up in Toronto, that kind of thing. So I'm disconnected in painful ways from my Acadian uh, roots, actually. Yeah. Um, uh, in the context of what we do in our homestead, it's a, it's a point of connection with so many people uh, in the riding. Not everybody in the riding is a large-scale farmer, mm -hmm. right? I'm meeting people who are doing just like we are. Um, and striving every year to figure out how do we get the most out of yep. our garden in a drought like this year. This year's unusual. Was very difficult. Yep. Um, and so I have, I have that point of, of contention. Um, and I think the other aspect of this is I'm the real deal. Like what you see is what you get. So I live by my values. I am authentic. Um, you're not going to have to guess <laughs> what I think about things. But I'm also very empathetic. I mean, I can hear lots of different points of view, lots of different ways of coming at an understanding um, of an issue. I've worked many years in building a consensus, but that doesn't mean I abdicate um, my ethics um, and the, the kinds of connections that I have with mm. what I feel is a way of being in relationship with each other and the planet. Um, and so that's always going to be the way I interpret a problem. Um, and I'm learned at FCM with municipalities, I mean, just a little story. When I first arrived there, I had been a very high profile campaigner at Sierra Club of Canada. It was front page news in the Globe and Mail that I was leaving uh, to go to work for the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. Before I even arrived at my job, um, people from across the country in coal based communities, there was a caucus of municipalities that were dependent on coal. Um, called for my firing. Yep. Um, when I first arrived at the annual conference that happened not too far from my arrival at, on the job, um, I met with the mayor of, of uh, Hinton, Alberta, and we sat down and I said, you know, Ross Rizvold, he was a wonderful person. I said, you know, let's not debate climate change. 
let's stay focused on solutions. I'm going to find things that help your community save money and achieve what you want to achieve. And when we run out of those things, we'll reevaluate our deal. We shook on it and we became huge partners um, over the course of, of several years to the point that he was part of a national process of municipalities to develop recommendations to the federal government on climate change investments for communities, mm -hmm. and he presented it to the board of directors. And mm -hmm. so that's what you can do mm -hmm. um, by finding that, that place um, which you have uh, common ground. And that's kind of what's happened so far in my communications with people. Um, but, you know, yes, I'm not there as the generational seven, eight generational tribe. Um, and I think that's actually a good thing. I'm a woman. I'm the only woman running in my uh, riding. Um, I have a different perspective. Um, and I'm a strong character. Yep. So. Can't, can't imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> Coming right at you. Yeah. Which is great. Yeah. Um, and thanks for wandering into that space. It's one of those narratives that never makes it into mainstream yeah. media. Yeah. It plays out every election. Yeah. And, and it's been sort of itching to surface it. Because... Yeah. It might be that a certain number of voters aren't even conscious yeah. that that's what they're doing. Yeah. Um, this is a one-month-long job interview. It is. You're supposed to be yes. choosing the best candidate. Exactly. Um, and sometimes that's the person you know. Yeah. And sometimes someone comes along, and goes, oh, my goodness, look at the skill sets and yeah. range. And yeah. it's like, oh, well, maybe that's different. That ties to the next question, and then we can wrap up. Is okay. um, A lot of times in provincial elections, voters will confuse voting for the candidate yes. with voting for the leader. Yes. Sometimes that works to advantage. So if you've got a great leader, boom, you know, I'll yeah. vote for your leader. But there's still a disconnect in there that yeah. <clears throat> you're not voting for the leader. You're exactly. voting for the person to do this work exactly. here. What's, uh, have you run into any of that? Yeah. I mean, you have the advantage. Mr. Coon's been in there for six years now yeah. and got over the hump from being alone to now having yeah. three people. And there's a visibility. Yeah. Um, so what, what, what's that like? And, and do you try to educate the voter that, no, you're voting for me. Yes, yeah. here's the team, yeah. and that's the leader of the team. Yeah. But when it gets down to it, you've got these four or five yeah. choices. Yeah. We know from polling, um, almost four in ten people say that when they vote, they vote based on the party. Hmm. Uh, okay. About three in ten say, I vote based on the qualifications of the candidate. Um, in my writing, I would say that Carlton York is a – We've always been conservative. We'll always be conservative. Um, and so that's really what I'm trying to break through. People who are voting uh, based on um, being green, um, it, they, they're voting green. It's the party. Um, somebody who's conservative is also potentially, that's what they're doing as a liberal or NDP. Um, or in our writing, it's Conservative Alliance and Greens. I'm currently in second place, by the way. <laughs> If you believe polls. If you believe polls and with a very wide error margin, right? So I'm very fine with all of that. But just just to make sure. me feel good for the sure. moment, sure. I'm in second place. It's like eating a candy bar. Absolutely. So um, so what I'm trying to break through is uh, that Carl Urquhart um, was the you know Minister of, of Public Safety, but also the MLA for a very long period of time. And he's essentially handed it off to his executive assistant. Hmm. Um and I have a problem with that. Um, I think that as electors, we should have more opportunities to be open, if you will, to other op options. Um, and so there's this belief that we'll be conservative forever, we'll never change. And I'm thinking, why not? So I'm trying to reach, I don't really, I don't really care about yep. that. Yep. What I care about is if you're a young person, if you're a woman and you want to see change, then vote for me. Um, and let's break this pattern because it's only real or embedded or inevitable if you let it be. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It doesn't have to be. Yeah. And, and that's getting people to recognize the moment in time that they're yes. living in. It's yes. 2020. And yeah. a shift occurred 2010, 2012. Yeah. And we're living in the chaos yeah. of when a major set of systems are all shifting at the same time. Exactly. Whether it's American politics, whether exactly. it's global politics, whether it's economies, whether exactly. it's climate, take exactly. your pick. You know? Exactly. And we, the next 10 years 
are going to set the tone for the next 50 or 60. Absolutely. So getting people to recognize it's not always how it's been. We're exactly. In a, we're in an odd window of time Who here. do we want to help us get to where we're going? Yeah. Um, and from, um, from, you know, from that perspective, um, you know, the pandemic has been, I hope, a real eye-opener for people. Mm -hmm. um, we can change. We can change quickly. Imagine if we just keep our hearts and minds open to that. We can change if we work together. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a perception, you know, that, oh, Mr. Higgs has really, you know, made, kept us safe. Absolutely not. That's outrageous. We're safe because it was collaborative government. There was a COVID cabinet committee. We worked together. And we're going to lose that if people hand him a mandate mm -hmm. um, where he says very clearly, I'm, you know, I don't really like politics. I don't want to have to take stuff to the legislature. I just want to impose my agenda. Well, no, thank you. I don't want that future. And so I hope that people will embrace change and uh, go for it. Let's go for some new ideas. There's a great F. Buckminster Fuller quote that I like to use a lot. It applies to this time if uh, you can't change the existing model by working within it. Yeah. You need to create a new model exactly. that makes the old model. Absolute, 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 uh, and, uh, uh, obsolete. Yeah. Right. Let's make it obsolete. It is obsolete. Um, and I feel in, in many ways that people are holding on to something that no longer is vi viable. Um, and so I don't know. I'm feeling pretty excited about the potential of COVID to open people's uh, minds and increase their confidence mm -hmm. about doing things differently. Mm -hmm. and another fun thing about change um, there's a, it turned out to be a Volkswagen ad of all things. You can find it on YouTube. Okay. You look up the fun theory and it's uh, where they converted a bunch of stairs, uh, access to a subway, I believe it was in Sweden. Okay. Forget which city. So they had an escalator and stairs beside each other and they wanted more people to take the stairs. So overnight with the cameras parked different places, high speed, they turned the stairs into piano keys. Okay. And they sound. They don't just have color. <laughs> so they sound. people... And two weeks later, 66% yeah. 60, more yeah. people yeah. took the stairs yeah. and took the escalator. Yeah. And the tagline was, change happens when it's fun. Exactly. And fun isn't trivial. Yeah. Play isn't trivial. Yeah. Creating isn't. And we're in a moment of creating or play yeah. of something new. Yeah. Um, to apply that to politics in New Brunswick is going to be the... <laughs> The, the magic of it all, because it, traditionally we've had another pattern. Yeah. So, I mean, for me, I think um, building on that, you know, I think change and motivation for change comes from a place of love as opposed to from a place of thinking about money. Um, and when you embrace, you know, I say to my students or when I'm working with people on climate change, walk through the love door, right? Walk through the love door. It's through that thinking about uh, what we care about, what we want to conserve, what we want to protect, how we want to be together, um, that we can do more things. Um, and so I really just urge people to think about what their love door looks like. And if they're thinking about change in the future, about what they love most, we've done a series of videos through the work I do with the Conservation Council called For the Love Of. And we interviewed New Brunswickers for the last couple of years about what they love to do. And it's a fantastic series of videos. It's on YouTube. And um, it shows not just what people love to do, but how climate change might affect that. And then we show, we have a special video on solutions and how people do their part. Um, and so a lot of my work is oriented to um, engaging through the love door. Um, I have to do policy work. Um, and I, I'm, it's important that my research is there and that I'm solid on my research, but my social science research shows um, that it's those positive emotions that motivate change. Um, fear can get your attention, but it's not going to get you to the finish line. So that's what I'm hoping we can um, get people to think about in terms of uh, how we think about this election, but how we also we deal with each other. Final thoughts? You didn't want, you want more final thoughts? No, well, we can <laughs> end that there. I was just thinking, that was awesome. You know, that was awesome. It's uh Yes, getting away from fear and moving into love would yeah. be where it, it would be where, where it shifts. Where it shifts, right? Yeah. Where it shifts. Also, I think, um, I mean, maybe in terms of final thoughts, um, you know, you've asked why things are stuck. Um, uh, I actually think they're stuck because we are, we're not encouraged to 
engage through our ethics. Um, and, you know, we think of ethics, um, I think, very narrowly, um, almost um, starving ethics um, with, you know, is it duty or is it rules or utilitarian where it's cost benefit analysis, right? That's kind of like what came out of the Enlightenment. My, um, my PhD studied ecological virtue ethics. What is character? What is ecological character? Um, and there's a few things that really pop out um, that we have to nurture. Um, and one is humility, um, to understand that we don't know everything and so therefore we need to work together, but also perseverance. And just how important it is to build your capacity to persevere and press through, <laughs> mm -hmm. be determined, um, and then um, to engage through benevolence and love. So um, I'm, I'm big on ecological character. <laughs> Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for watching. Be good. Have fun. Love each other. Bye. Bye. <laughs>